Hello, everyone. Welcome to Thermo Fisher Scientific for this STEM webinar series. This is Chida Mesoy Keskin Bora, Product Marketing Manager at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Today, we have Dr. Weber with us. He will talk about the LiberTem software. Dr. Weber is working as a group leader uh, for data and software at uh, Ernest Suska Center at Portion Center in Muley. His activities include high speed live and offline processing with the LiberTem project. For the STEM data management and automation. He has a PhD, uh, material science PhD degree from Forschung Centrum Rurally, and he worked as a product manager at SAIS. Dieter, the stage is yours. Thank you, Chilem, for, for the kind introduction and for the uh, invitation. Uh, so yeah, as you mentioned, um, I'm working on the on the Libertem uh, project. I'm one of the core developers. Uh, the other ones are Alexander Clausen and Matthew Bryan. Um, and uh, the reason we started the project was um, uh, in 2016, 2017, when we uh, started um, developing the idea um, to allow working with really fast detectors with, for example, 40 STEM detectors as easily as with normal TEM cameras. Um, so at this time, it was apparent that there was a huge step change in, in camera performance in terms of uh, frame rate and uh, data rate. And um, also then the data size that you record becomes really large. Uh, potentially. Um, and at this time, we saw there was really no software that would allow you to do all the things that you could do. And at the same time, we saw the potential of this technique um, and so set out uh, to, to start up a project to develop uh, proper software support for this. Um, yeah, given given the performance requirement, we did then, then some analysis some uh, of existing software. We did the requirements analysis and really came to the point that we had to develop a whole new processing engine for this. There was nothing quite there that could do this because we didn't only want to have high speed on offline data. For this one, we could have gone with, for example, Dask, like the Hyperspy and uh, Pixam project. But we also want to do high speed processing on live data. I will not show this today, but the uh, the main point there is that um, everything that works on offline data also works exactly the same way on live data and vice versa. You just exchange the, the data uh, source and of course the tooling is a bit different. So with live data you then juggle the microscope, the camera, the connections. Um, so offline data is a bit uh, easier and that's also what we started with. The Libertum project can do a lot more than what you're uh, seeing today. Today I'm showing some basic use cases on offline data. The first thing is if you want to have any information on our software, also links to various sub-projects I can uh, start now uh, with the screen sharing. Let me just open a browser window for this. So the first thing is I point you to our uh, landing page. This is really a good starting point if you find, want to find anything about our project. So just maybe a, a quick uh, recap what we will do. So I will first show uh, the installation. It's a Python based application. So we will also install Python for this or I show you how to do it. I have it already on my system. I would then show you the web GUI, which is, I think, uh, quite useful to inspect files. It was the first thing that we developed to showcase the capabilities that we developed for the engine. It's a web application that allows you to very quickly and interactively explore for the STEM data set. So I think this is quite useful at the microscope when you want to see what you recorded. Is it any good? Then it will also show you coordinate system calibration. That's something fairly new that we developed which then helps to do tachography, which is then the last uh, step that I will demonst demonstrate. The first thing is installing. Of course, we have uh, in our documentations a section on installation. You find it here. It boils down to, uh, well, we don't cover installing Python, so I have Miniconda installed. This is what I would recommend if you don't do a, a system-wide uh, installation. In, on, a, on a Linux system, you can maybe use the package manager, but even there with Miniconda, you have an advantage that it's relatively easy to set up environments with different Python versions, which with the other methods is, is not that straightforward. So this is uh, generally what I would uh, recommend. So we have installers for different operating systems, and that's also what I will be using. Of course, there's also Anaconda with the GUI, if you prefer that, that also works, but I always prefer the command line for these things. It's just, if you know how to do it, it's just uh, a lot faster. So we, we have here, I will not go in detail, I will actually do all these things <laughs> in different ways. Um, I should also mention if you want to install Libertem on microscope computers that don't have an internet connection, there it's a bit different. Uh, we also have a section here in the installation, the uh, air gap installation, you find it here. Uh, you need essentially two computers with the same operating system, architecture and Python version. And one of them has internet, this is the, the host. And then the target, you transfer, you prepare some things and then transfer that to the target system and then install uh, there. So this is all laid out uh, here. So if you have this use case, I can encourage you to check out our installation uh, documentation. 
Let's get started with setting up the Python environment. By the way, you see that I'm uh, working on Linux. Uh, that actually has a short story. So we did a previous version of this recording on Windows and the performance was so slow that I got finally fed up and now have nuked Windows and switched to Linux. Uh, and you, you'll see, uh, make your own judgment how, how fast that is. So Cheatham, you saw how it was before. So now we see how that will go. Uh, so generally, if you want to do anything with big data, high performance, large memory, this sort of stuff, fast IO, just use Linux. It just uh, handles these use cases much better than Windows. So for Word or PowerPoint or browsing the internet, Windows is just fine. But th there is a reason that virtually all supercomputers run on Linux. So let's first start with creating a conda environment. So as I said, I've already mini conda set up. So you see here the little prompt that shows which environment we, uh, we are. Let's just call it libertem demo. And I use uh, uh, the most recent uh, Python that we support, Python 3.12. So we try to keep current with uh, the Python versions. It's just we also have dependencies. So, so it might sometimes lag a, a bit behind because we depend on a lot of, lot of packages and of course all of them need to support the Python version that we use. So we just do this. Wait a short moment. Yes, that looks good. Yeah, that was it. So now we activate the environment. Okay, as simple as that. Now I will install a fast pip uh, replacement, so to speak. That makes this whole thing a lot more fun. UV, it's called, I can really recommend it. It's written in Rust. And if you have a fast system like Linux, it does the stuff that is not IO dependent uh, a lot faster. So the next thing is I will now deviate a bit from the installation from the normal one because we have in the current development version a fix for MPAT files. So thanks to Cheatham who sent us some, some test files, we, we tracked that one down. Uh, there was a, a small issue in interpreting these uh, MPAT XML files and we don't have a release yet. So we are preparing one, but it's not out there. So I will install the development version that has this fix because I will show things on MPAT files. And for this one, we can actually install directly from, uh, from GitHub. So I'll show you how that works. What you see is you put in URL with the repository, git plus HTTPS and so on. Um, which is our GitHub repository. And the square brackets mean I will install an extra, which is the bqplot extension. We will need that later for some fast plotting. So this is not strictly necessary for everything, but for tachography and for the uh, live calibration, this one is just very useful in, in Jupyter Notebooks. So now it will um, download this dependency and then install it. Okay, that was this. it. And now we should have already a working uh, Libertem web interface. Um, I should say, um, when you run Libertem for the very first time, it's just in time compiling uh, quite a bit of uh, code that is written in Numba in compiled Python. So that means in the very beginning, some operations are sluggish. And sometimes it also, if you, for example, open a new file type, it will, it will compile the file readers, all these things, some high performance code. So the first run is a bit sluggish. The following ones uh, get a lot faster. You will see this. Now we start, uh, just start the server. So in the documentation, we would now be in the GUI usage part here. As you see, that's what I'm doing. And uh, then the whole thing starts up. The error message was just Libertem being unhappy that it couldn't figure out its own version, so we can ignore that. Um, I should say uh, Libertem has GPU support, which I didn't install here. Uh, and for uh, the file inspection, generally, it's, it's not very useful. It's more for uh, some high performance computation stuff. If you have uh, some more computationally intensive stuff, applications, then this can be useful for simple file ins inspection that runs just fine on the CPU. Now we start in the background a, a Dask cluster that we use uh, for offline processing as an execution engine. Yeah, now we can have a look at files. Uh, I've already downloaded some uh, files here on my system. I used the uh, Nextcloud from our data management uh, system. Since we want to do live calibration later, I can uh, actually download some data sets from there that uh, he from Thermo Fisher uh, sent me. So like, we can just have a look here. Let, let's just pick any, I um, think th this one is not bad. Um, you see, you click, ah, but then maybe this was a bit too fast. Um, I uh, just want to show you, I click on the XML file that comes from an NPAT data set. And this one is then here recognized, uh, also thanks to the fix. And we can, uh, all the parameters are there and we can just uh, load it. You can also influence these things um, as you need. 
So we open it. And as I said, the first run is going to take a bit. Uh, we can also always inspect what, what the system is doing here on the, on the console window. And yeah, it's now starting warm up, which is a uh, pre-compilation phase for the first uh, start. By the way, uh, the reason that this is a web interface is very simple. Um, I might show this, show this also a bit later because we can also run the web interface uh, remotely from another computer. So right now the server process is running um, on the same computer as the browser window, but we can also run the server process very easily on another system. For example, on a high performance system with fast data access. And that of course gives us then um, yeah, excellent performance because the results from the computations are way smaller than uh, the data itself in 4 stem. That's why we chose this architecture. Yeah, now let's just um, do a virtual detector. A good start is often disk, so we uh, integrate over a region of the detector. Again, it's uh, taking a small while to start up, and um, yeah, but now we see something. And we can do this analysis, and we see nothing. The reason is that this one is not a normal 4D STEM data set. Uh, this one is uh, uh, one that is strongly overfocused, as the name suggests. Um, so that means we have actually images on the detector. But if we want to, for example, see what is actually recorded, we can then go into pick mode, which then loads uh, individual detector images. Um, ah, yeah, to, to, to explain what we are seeing, the left is in, uh, in default mode, in, in average, is an average of all detector images, and the right is then the trace uh, of whatever we are doing here in scan dimension. So this is the scan, and since we integrate over a large region, that shows us nothing. So we now let's have a look at individual detector frames. And there we see a specimen. You see, I move the pointer around, and uh, we see a shadow image projection of the specimen. So what we can do in this case is actually plot the, uh, the trace of a single point on the detector uh, as a function of scan position. And for this one, we have the point selection. Uh, let's just go with the center, which is the default. And then we have it uh, here. Also note, this is uh, done fairly quickly. Uh, let me show you how big the data set is. Uh, so 64 by 64 by 128 by 128. Um, that must be, uh, what, like half a gigabyte or something? Let me um, uh, let me have a look at the file, actually, because we can. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a quarter gigabyte, actually. Uh, so uh, that, of course, is then, is then very fast. That's a really small file, uh, thankfully. Yeah, so now we see here the point. Let's also go, for example, here in pick mode. Um, I can maybe also open a, another file to show you more uh, conventional for this stem. Uh, one thing that you notice, if you move the pointer around here, then the um, image shifts in a different direction. So here, if we go right, it goes up. And if we go up, it goes right. And uh, that already shows you that the coordinate system here is not calibrated, uh, or we have to calibrate the coordinate system. Uh, Libertam doesn't care. It works in pixel coordinates uh, in most cases, unless you have an analysis method that supports other parameters. So that means here we cannot change this. It will always plot it like this, but we see that something is up, and we definitely, for tachography, for example, uh, on this microscope, we definitely need to look into the right settings. We cannot just work with the defaults, because the result will be garbage, quite frankly. So let's maybe open another uh, more conventional 4D STEM data set. Uh, we have here our test data, for example. Uh, we have here also an MPAT data set, which is uh, in this case on uh, bismuth iron oxide, a high resolution STEM, if I, uh, if I recall correctly. So here we let's do some NLR dark field on this one. Yep, you see half a second. Um, that's how it should be. Yeah, we see a nice uh, crystal lattice. And now we can, for example, also do NLR uh, bright field if we want to. Let's see if we get something. Ah, yeah, we get a nice contrast, even some, some ox oxygen that we can uh, see there uh, with this one. And here, for example, we can also do uh, center of mass. Here, have a quick look. So we don't have ICOM or anything in here, but we can definitely, for example, look at the magnitude. You see these nice donut uh, shapes uh, here of the deflection, the divergence, uh, and the curl. The curl should be flat if uh, more or less if if you have a real uh, electrostatic field and deflection. So this structure here already shows you that something is maybe off with the calibration. We have here a guess function that might work here, but this one is, I have to say, not 100% reliable. It tries to minimize the curl. It looks actually quite good here if we look at the divergence uh, we get here. So we should get at atom columns a convergence, so that means a negative divergence, and that looks more or less right. But uh, yeah, this is not enough uh, for a reliable calibration, I should say. Uh, one should really um, do this other method that I, that I will show you. Anyway, so you also see uh, in, in color-coded the, the plot. I should say that the web interface is on purpose relatively simple, so we don't have color bars. We um, 
don't have export functions for the plots here. And that's a bit on purpose because we don't want to re-implement yet again all these GUI functions that you have for uh, data analysis software. This was meant as a relatively quick demo to show what it does, but it's actually quite useful, so we, we maintain it. Uh, in the future, we would prefer to build on a framework that has all these functions, interactive um, traces or different color schemes, uh, um, uh, color um, uh, maps, and so on, that has this built and that we don't re-implement all these things. So that, yeah, that, that just for a bit of explanation why it is so simple. Uh, so it's meant for, for quick inspection. Yeah, now we have opened files, applied some analysis. Yeah, that brings me to the end of, uh, of the GUI. So it has a lot more functions here. You can see for different purposes. Again, uh, we have, let's see what we have documented here. We have different functions, Aha, uh, which uh, is actually interesting. I should show this about talking about plotting. You can also download the Jupyter Notebook uh, that corresponds to the analysis. So this is what it would look like. So that means you can then, uh, for example, you get the plots here and then you can do your own plotting if you really want to change things. Or you can also change the parameters here. So that helps to, to go from, uh, from the GUI into Jupyter Notebooks uh, that you don't have to type all this boilerplate here yourself. I think that was um, the main point. You can also, for example, use Google and always like Google for something. Libertem that helps also to access the documentation just to say that. So it uh, uh, has grown a bit large and we want to reorder that a bit at some point. But as these things go, always have things to do. So, you know, didn't get around yet. Yeah, I think that that shows the GUI, the web GUI. And now we can actually do some calibration maybe with this uh, data set here. So for this one, um, I actually, so here the server is still running. We can keep this running. This is maybe useful. Uh, so I will just have a second shell here where I activate the environment. And now for the, uh, for the live calibration, I will install some more packages. Uh, the first thing is, that's actually a good point to point this out. So this, this is, this is the repository for this one. Uh, we didn't do a release yet. That's on the to-do list to, to clean everything up and release. So this, this method is uh, published. We have a preprint online. It's also submitted uh, to a journal. And uh, so this is still on the list to actually make a proper software release from this. Uh, but for now, we can install from, from GitHub like we did with Libertemp. So if you really want to know more details about the method, you find this here, uh, everything described in the, in the paper. Um, it's derived from the yeah, overfocus method where you compare a stem image to an overfocus projection on the detector. It's just having some software help that uh, will make this a bit easier. It's based on superimposing. And so you have a 40 stem data set that is overfocused. Uh, over that means that uh, this is what we saw here. We see the um, shadow image shifting as a function of scan position. And if you know the exact transformation from here to the, from the right to the left here, uh, or from the left to the right, you can stack all these detector frames on top of each other and get an image of the specimen. Right, so you know exactly how it's turned, how it's enlarged um, as a function of scan, and then you get a uh, sharp image. Um, however, if there is anything off, the superposition will be blurred. Uh, so this is what you see here. Uh, so th these are these shadow projections, and here on F, they are correct. You see like they, they get assembled to this face, and here they are just um, shifted or rotated or whatnot. And then this doesn't work. So, so this is based on this. If you get the parameters right, you get a sharp image. So you just twiddle, fiddle the parameters until the image is sharp. And uh, that's basically the, the gist of it. So we can now copy this one here that I don't have to type everything. And we need this git plus and then, and then I think it likes the dot git at the end. Otherwise it might get unhappy. At least it was uh, in the past like this. Yeah, see, that was very easy. We also now want to have uh, Jupyter installed. So we just, uh, so this is Jupyter uh, Lab, Jupyter Notebook, and the Matplotlib support for IPy widgets, which is now also uh, necessary for interactive plots in the newest releases. So let's just uh, do this. That was fast. That's how it should be. Let me explain why the calibration of the coordinate system is important for 40 stem. So uh, in, in 40 stem, we have uh, essentially two two-dimensional, let's say, projections or areas of interest. So the first one is the scan, of course. This is what we see on the right here from this uh, point analysis. On And of course, we also have the detector. And um, the thing is, 
on a microscope, you have various factors that can influence how the scan direction relates to the uh, directions on the detector. If you, for example, look at uh, tachography, um, for example, methods like uh, single sideband tachography, uh, single sideband tachography essentially um, measures um, the intensity difference on the detector as a function of scan position and then reconstructs the object in, uh, in Fourier space. Um, basically, it, it probes the um, prevalence of certain spatial frequencies in the object from intensity changes on the detector. And these intensity changes happen in certain directions in certain regions of the detector. So that means if you don't, if you have your detector rotated, you will essentially record the wrong directions, the wrong frequencies, the wrong values. So you will record something, but definitely not the specimen. And um, also here is an example for ICOM that maybe uh, um, uh, showcases this. So integrated center of mass ICOM is also relatively similar to, for example, single sideband tachography, um, if you dig into it. Um, on the right, we see a good reconstruction with correct values. And we, uh, we have a samarium hexaboride here. And you really, really nicely get contrast from the um, boron atom columns here that we see this fine white uh, spots nicely resolved. On the left, it's rotated by 90 degrees. So that means that, uh, yeah, essentially the, the uh, spatial frequencies that you record, they, they point in the wrong direction, so to speak, um, and you get a completely different result. That means if you miscalibrate this um, or uh, don't have it um, uh, done at all, uh, you get garbage results, right? Like quite literally garbage. Um, so it's really, really important to do this reliably. And um, in this paper, we explain this a bit more. The thing is that there are many error sources on the way, right? So the, the first thing is that, of course, you can use on your microscope scan rotation. You can just, uh, I don't know, turn this knob and rotate your image, everything nice. It's just unless you have an integrated software package that then reads this value from the microscope, is perfectly calibrated, everything fits, and the detector doesn't know that you uh, rotated the scan. So the data set will, um, the detector will be not affected, but your scan coordinates will be different. Um, so that you have to record that if you use scan rotation. The second thing is that, of course, the detector can be rotated in some way. It might not be mounted always the same way in the column. Um, so that is something to check. Your scan generator might have different ideas where access points. So this we also have seen. If you use a different scan generator for conventional stem and for 40 stem, which is a setup that you often see in microscopes, you have to be sure that both scan generators have the same parameters if you want to use a con if you want to relate a conventional stem with a 40 stem image right so they can have different they can even have handedness changes that's also an important one we don't only have rotation but we also have handedness change which means one axis is flipped conventionally uh, uh, colloquially speaking and the next chain where things can go uh, wrong which is also an interesting one and maybe unexpected and um, different software can have different ideas how the axis in the data set or the array layout in the data set should be represented on screen. In Libertem and many other plotting software, we have the convention, it's, it's like TV or text, that the um, zero, zero point is on the left upper corner, the X axis points right, and the Y axis points down. And uh, in Libertem, we follow the uh, C layout. That means that the fast axis, the um, X axis, is um, is the the minor axis or uh, yeah the, the fast axis the, the last axis in an array is the is the x axis and the y axis is then um, the the second I think then in Fortran it's the other way around and I think also in MATLAB so that means if you have the same data set and you just memory map it and tell your software interpret this as an array you might get different results depending on uh, what conventions you use. Yeah, and, uh, and yeah your software can interpret maybe or uh, arrays in C order but then just plot them upside down. Um, compared to other software. So that means if you do then the alignment manually, um, you can, um, yeah, you, you, you use then one software for the alignment and another software for, for the data processing, um, there might be a mismatch between the two. So you have to validate that uh, how these different softwares that you use actually interpret axis and coordinate systems. And the last one is if you do a manual rotation calibration, are you always sure that uh, you know which direction is a positive uh, direction, uh, which is the reference, which is the thing that is rotated? If you mix these things up, uh, you also get a sign error on your rotation, uh, for example. And if you have, for example, something like a grid, let me show you another uh, data set that has a really high uh, symmetry. Let me just navigate there. This is, I think, also a nice thing to show. I think it's this one. 
Let's also do a point analysis here. Yeah, this one has a really, really high symmetry. So you in, in this one, you don't even see where is up, where is down. Uh, if you flipped something, you will never be the wiser. Um, so that means you need to have, a, this one is actually a better one for calibration because it has a low symmetry, right? So this has uh, essentially no symmetry. You also see a handedness change, but not with all specimens that you might use, you might notice this um, uh, in time. I mean, this one always has also mirror symmetry. It's just, it's fortunately broken. Um, but yeah, one can, one can get tricked by these things if you do it by hand. So that's why we developed a software that helps to automate this and also the calibration method uh, here this one, also that is shown in the paper, this is validated to interpret the scan rotation and the flip uh, in the same way as our typography implementation. So we made sure that if you use parameters from one, you determine it with one method and then apply it there, then this one will be interpreted in the same way, given that you didn't change anything else on the microscope. If you then turn the scan rotation in between and didn't keep a record of, or of course, the data set is still then off, but as long as you carefully calibrate and then move directly to typography without changing parameters or at least keeping a record of the parameters, then this should work.